Okay everyone, we're back on the Ford Mondeo Mark IV today. And by the way, this is a 2014 2 litre Peugeot diesel engine. And the reason for this video is a bit of an odd one. Well it's odd in the sense that I've never had this problem in more years than I can count. And this is it, a broken valve spring. But what's getting me is, it's actually broken into three pieces. And I do find that quite unusual. Through all the years we've had these Mondeos here, we've never had a broken valve spring. And most of these cars have done well over 250,000 miles and they've been abused by every man and his dog. This particular car has only got around about 150,000 miles on the clock, so it's one of the actual lower mileage cars. So I'm trying to rack my brains to why this valve spring is broken. Has it just broken through fatigue? I find it a bit funny that it hasn't happened before. I am wondering though, it is a woman driver. So possibly she was looking in the interior mirror, doing her makeup, tried to shift down and instead of hitting third gear, maybe hit first gear, over revved it and made the valve spans. Well, I've got to put all conspiracy theories on the table, haven't I now? But if any of you know any better or any reason why this valve spring could have broken, leave a comment down below. Okay, just a bit of a backstory here to how I come to the conclusion this was a broken valve spring. When this car came through the door, it was running on three cylinders. If I switched the engine off and cranked it over, it actually sounded like it had a low compression. But regardless of that, I have to carry out a checking procedure. And the first thing is to connect a scanner up and read the ECU codes. There was only one code in the ECU, which basically related to cylinder number one in balance. If you are familiar with these engines, you'll know that cylinder number one is by the flywheel side and not over by the cam belt side. I don't know what it is with the French, why they've got to have their cylinders arse about face. God only knows. But anyway, I then start the car up and I pull the wire off injector number one. As I do that, the revs raise up. That says to me that ECU has just recognised that I've made injector number one open circuit. So I'm thinking the wiring to injector number one is working. So next thing, I'm gonna carry out a fuel injector leak off test. Basically, if the injector is dumping too much fuel from the leak off pipe back to the tank, the injector's faulty. I didn't actually think this was gonna be the problem because normally if the, if the injector's making too much fuel back to the tank, it will put the car into limp mode, not make it misfire. But I carried out the test anyway. Needless to say, there was nothing wrong with the leak off test. It all came out fine. So I'm thinking to myself, maybe the actual injector is faulty electrically and it's just dud and not working. So I can't really test the injector, but I had a donor car. So I swapped in a good injector from the donor car into this particular car. And guess what? It was still misfiring. At which point alarm bells are ringing and I'm thinking, oh my God, this problem is a bit more serious than I first thought. So out comes the compression tester. So I've got quite a comprehensive uh, diesel compression tester kit here. Most of these actually go in the glow plug holes, but on this particular engine, it's difficult to get to the glow plugs. So you really need to go in through the injectors. And in this little box here, we have the particular nozzle to actually fit in these engines. We have a little extension piece here, which just screws in like so. And it has a copper washer on the end. Once you've removed your fuel injector from your cylinder head, you would then take this injector nozzle here and you would fit this clamp over the top of it and you would put this whole nozzle assembly down where your injector would go. And the bolt that normally holds your injector to the head, you would put through this slot and that would bolt this whole injector assembly securely to your head. And then I can connect the compression tester gauge union into the injector, like so. And when you crank the engine over, this would give you a reading of how much compression is in the engine. 
So I carried out a compression test on all four cylinders. And in cylinders two, three and four, there was approximately 300 pounds per square inch of compression in each of the three cylinders. Cylinder number one, there was absolutely, voila, nothing, zero. So now I'm faced with a dilemma. We need to get the car back on the road through the simplest method possible. There's an engine down the road for 1,200 pound. I could just get the engine, put it in the car and rebuild this one at a later date and have it as a spare engine. Or I could investigate what has actually gone wrong with this car. And I was thinking to myself, I actually want to know why it's lost a cylinder because it's an unusual problem. So I thought, if I've got to take the engine out, if I spend an extra hour and a half taking the top cover off, it'd be worth it just to find out if I was to see anything. If I take the top cover off and can't find nothing, then I could carry on taking the engine out and just replace the engine. You see, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, ah, the valve rockers in these engines are designed to break if a piston was to hit the valve. And I'm thinking, maybe for some reason, one of these valve rockers have broken. And if it is just a rocker that's broken, all I've got to do is take the top cover off. I've got a whole bunch of valve rockers that are spare. I could just replace one of them. And that would be an easy little fix. So I decided to take the rocker cover off, which is not quite an easy job. You've got to take the cam belt off, the high pressure fuel pump off, there's all sorts you've got to take off. It's about an hour and a half to two hours job to get that rocker cover off. The camshafts have to come out. And by the way, if you want to know how to get it all apart, somewhat, I can show you how to do that here. Anyway, needless to say, once I removed the cover, there it was, a broken valve spring. I thought, great. How the hell am I going to change that valve spring? Because I've got a valve spring compressor, but that involves having the cylinder head removed and I really didn't want to take the cylinder head off. So I'm going to show you now how I remove that valve spring. Right, lucky me, I've got a dud engine. I can show you how to replace this valve spring on. So obviously we've got all our cover taken off and now you have to remove both camshafts, you would have pinned your crankshaft up in order to remove your cam belt in the first place. So you see there's a locking pin that goes through the back of the block and into the flywheel. If you want to know how to time this engine up or even change your cam belt on this engine, you can see that here. If you have timed this engine up as if you were going to change the cam belt, cylinders one and number four will both be on TDC so the pistons will be at their highest. You could, if you wanted to, put a piece of rod down the injector hole into the cylinder and turn the crankshaft over. And when the rod reaches its highest point, you know then that the piston is at TDC. And then you can just get hold of your valve rocker and pull that out with the hydraulic tappet attached. As you can see, the valve is sunk down in the head quite a way. So I've got to find a way of removing this valve spring. Okay, then I've got an ordinary valve spring compressor here. So what I decided was, the smaller end that would compress a spring, I take that off, and I'll position that just on top of the valve. It won't stay in place at the minute, but I'll sort that shortly. So I thought to myself, there's loads of threads here, so all I need is a flat bar. So I've got this piece of flat metal that I've drilled a couple holes in, and using the bolts that would hold the cover down, I can just put these in the threads, put the valve spring compressor piece like so, and screw them in. So my thinking is, when I screw these two bolts down, it's going to push this down, and thus press the valve spring down, so I can get to the collets and remove them. And because the piston is sitting so close to the valve, when the valve drops down just a fraction, it's going to be held up enough by the piston so I can remove the spring without having to put any kind of compressed air in the cylinder. Okay, I'll whack these two bolts down. And as I start to wind them bolts down, it's compressing the spring in and releasing the collets. 
So now, using a magnetic screwdriver, I can remove these collets quite easily. And there we have one collet removed. And obviously, when you refit that, you put a little piece of grease inside that collet, it will help it to stick to the valve stem better. Now our collets are removed, that's the hard bit over with. I can just loosen these bolts and release the valve spring. And I can now lift this valve spring straight off the valve. You'll notice the valve is hard up against the top of the piston now, so it can't go anywhere and it can't fall inside the cylinder. So you see, I never knew that you could remove the valve springs with a cylinder head still on the car. I'm glad I've done that now. So if any of you get the same problem, which might be a long shot, because I think it's a pretty rare occurrence for a valve spring to break on one of these engines in the first place, but if you do, you can now be rest assured you haven't got to take the head off. Do you know, it's a bit quiet in here. In fact, I haven't heard a peep from anyone in the office all day. I'm going to take a look. Yo! So, how's the world of office then? Well, it looks like they're all too busy to even bother talking. <sighs> okay, I know where I'm not wanted. Alan, shut the door on your way out. So that's why it's been so quiet in the office. They're obviously busy. I'll just have to find somebody else to annoy. Oh well. Till the next time, see ya.